All right, praise the Lord. We are going to we come together to worship the Lord. That is how it ought to be. We come together to praise God, to give Him glory, to worship Him. But in our coming together to worship the Lord, sometimes we miss God. And so I want to share something that um, was on, it's always been on my heart, to sh- and I have shared it often when I used to be the pastor of this church. I just want to stress when I used to be. You now have a wonderful leadership team who are doing a brilliant job. Uh, but I want to speak about the gifts of the Spirit and desiring the gifts of the Spirit. So there's not really a title, uh, there's not real t- a title to this message. But last week, we had a wonderful time of worship. However, twice during the time of worship, we missed the Holy Spirit. There were two distinct times in, a, in our time of worship where the Spirit of God wanted us to do something and we rushed into the next song. Now, this is not a rebuke. Everyone say, David is not rebuking me. This is not a rebuke. This is not a criticism. We have to learn how to heed the voice of God. You all are familiar with the account of Samuel. Young Samuel in the household of Eli, when his mother Hannah dedicated him uh, to the Lord, and he moves in with the high priest. And one night the Lord calls to Samuel. And Samuel thought it was Eli. And so he goes to Eli and says, well, here I am. You're all familiar with that. Samuel had to learn how to hear the voice of God. So this is not a rebuke, this is not a correction, and we are not going to go hyper-charismatic on anybody. This we can guarantee. So let's just commit God's Word to our hearts and... Let's start. Father God, please let your Word be our instructor. And as JP prayed, have your way amongst us. Let your name be glorified, Lord. Teach us, lead us in your ways, in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 5, and we're going to read verse 17. Luke chapter 5, verse 17. If there's anything you don't understand while I'm sharing, please don't hesitate just to Raise your hand, ask a question, ask for clarity, because this is really important that we actually understand the importance of spiritual gifts and how they function, how they should function, how we respond to the Lord. And in Luke chapter 5, verse 17, the Bible tells us, Now it happened on a certain day, as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Or the power of the Lord was with him to heal. So we have a situation where Jesus is teaching. He's expounding the word of God, and there are Pharisees and teachers of the law, and God in his mercy manifest himself to heal. Now, for those of you who are familiar with this portion of Scripture, we know that no, not one of the Pharisees or the teachers of the law got healed that day. What happened instead was um, some locals dropped their friend through the roof tiles and Christ healed him, thus offending the Pharisees. The Bible says in verse 18, And behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And they break open the tiles of the roof, and verse 20 says, When Jesus saw their faith, he said to them, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, when you read this portion of Scripture, and I'm assuming that you've all read it because you study the Bible diligently and you have come across this, and just, so you know the account, we don't have to go through it. What is interesting is the Spirit of God manifests Himself while Jesus is teaching. It is the desire of God's Spirit to heal the Pharisees. But they do not respond. Those who not are, are not even in the house, knowing that Jesus is there, 
can't get in, and so they break through the roof and let their friend in. When Christ heals their friend, instead of the Pharisees and Sadducees and the, the teachers of the law saying, Lord, me too, what do they do? They go into a theological debate. They go into the head. God is present by the Spirit, and they land up in the soul. And this, unfortunately, is what happens in churches. Now, many of us are incredibly offended and put off by the demonic spirits that have come into the Christian church. They began with the Kundalini spirit, with the Rodney Howard Browns and the Toronto, and now they have gotten even worse with... Bethel and all the nonsense that goes through that church movement. If you're part of it, that is not God, it is demonic. Just like Jesus warned that in the last days there will be those that have an anointing, and because of the anointing and the signs and wonders, they will deceive many. We are seeing this. We're seeing an increase in the supernatural in churches, but it's not God. Now, Satan is a counterfeiter. He can only counterfeit that which is real. Agreed. So if God didn't heal and signs and wonders and miracles weren't part of how God dealt with mankind, then Satan wouldn't counterfeit them. Do you understand that? Satan counterfeits the real. He doesn't innovate. Satan doesn't create. He's not creative. He's not innovative. He cannot bring to light something of his own. He has to pervert what God has already done. So which means that there is the real. But so many of us have been so offended and, 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 and terrified that a false spirit will come into our churches that we have thrown the real out as well. And this needs to be addressed. Anyway, I have spoken much about it, so we're not going to use this forum. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law missed what God wanted for them. It is common that we miss God. When the Lord manifests for a purpose, and because we're not spiritually sensitive, we miss God. I've seen this happen so many times. Whether in church, whether in home church, uh, the Lord wants to do something, and folk don't respond, and you literally sense the Lord, you sense the Lord saying, that's it. And the whole spiritual atmosphere changes, and it's just then back to normal. We return you to your normal program. Now, regarding spiritual gifts, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it amazes me that many folk who identify themselves as being full gospel, Pentecostal, charismatic, uh, semi-automatic, uh, <laughs> but identify with the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit, how they do not desire to be used of God in this arena. It amazes me that most of our churches are quite happy to go through their normal you know, program of a couple of, you know, you have the announcements, you have a couple of songs, then you have the offertory, then you have the message, and then the cup of tea, and you go home. That is the, that is the routine of most churches. It's certainly not biblical, but it's what we do. It's tradition. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul is addressing clearly a question that had been asked of him by the church of Corinth regarding spiritual gifts. The purpose for 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 is the Apostle Paul is responding to questions that he has re received from the church that he clarify certain aspects regarding spiritual gifts. It's not there because Paul decided it's a good teaching. Right? He's responding to their questions. And he says at the end of chapter 12, and again, I'm assuming that most of us have read this. For those of you being in the church, I have taught on this extensively in the past. But Paul says in verse 31, but earnestly desire the best gifts. So he speaks on the spiritual gifts. He tells us what they are in uh, verses uh, 8 
8 through 10, he tells us what these gifts are. And then he tells us, or he tells the church to earnestly desire them. Chapter 13 is the better way. He says at the end of uh, verse 31, sorry, verse 31 of chapter 12, he says, But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. The more excellent way is chapter 13. It's one thing to desire, but if you walk in love, and you walk in the love of God, then there's a greater chance that God's going to use you. God chooses vessels who love the brethren. And so that's the better way. Now, chapter 14, Paul is going to expound on the practical ministry of the gifts, how these gifts are to be ministered when the church comes together. And he starts off by saying, pursue love. So he continues where he left off in chapter 13. Love is the better way. Love is not boastful. Love is, love is not proud. Love believes all things, hopes all things. This is the characteristic of love, which he mentions in, the, in chapter 13. And he starts chapter 14 by saying, pursue love. If you want to see spiritual gifts, what is the requirement? That we have agape, that we have a genuine love for the brethren. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. Now that word desire is important. It's the Greek word, zelos, zelos. So you're zelos for some spanikopitad. <laughs> Sounds like what you? Zealous. That's what the word means. It means not just to desire. It's like, oh yeah, oh gosh, it's cold. I desire oh, to go into bed. That's like, oh, it will kind of be nice. But to be zealous for something is to be passionate. It's to really want. And so that's what Paul is saying, that we are to desire, we are to be zealous for spiritual gifts. Oh my gosh, Dave, now you sound like a charismatic. You sound like the people down the road. No, I'm reading the Bible. Don't allow the lens of offense to blur the Word of God. Just because we have seen the offense, we have seen the counterfeit, we have seen the rotten. Do not allow what Satan has done to cloud the clear teaching of Scripture. Where there's a counterfeit, it must be replaced with the real. We don't dis disregard the real because of a counterfeit. Paul says, be zealous, be desirous, be passionate for spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. And then when he closes off the chapter, when he closes off the teaching on spiritual gifts, in the last verse of chapter 14, he says, Therefore, brethren, earnestly desire to prophesy, and do not forbid to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. So, these are the spiritual gifts. The catalyst is love. Desire them. Desire that you function, especially in prophecy. Don't forbid the speaking in tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. Okay, so I'm not going to go through the teaching. There is, I have done so much teaching on this. What I want us to look at is our response to the Holy Spirit. The purpose for spiritual gifts is not to launch anybody into ministry. The purpose of spiritual gifts is not for somebody to say, I have the gift of healing. None of us have any gift. When it comes to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, as mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, they come upon individuals for a short time, as the Holy Spirit wills, for the profit and the benefit of all. And this is what Paul says in chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians 12. He says, But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. 
and you don't have a gift. You don't have the gift of prophecy. You do not have the gifts of tongues and interpretation. You don't have the gift of wisdom and the gift of knowledge and the gift of healings. You do not have these gifts. They come upon you as the Spirit wills for the edification of the church, is what Paul says in verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. God, by His Spirit, wants to communicate with His church. The Lord, in 99% of the times, will always use His Word to communicate with us. But there are things in the Word of God, or let me say, there are things in our lives that we can't find in the Scriptures. Although my name is mentioned and my surname is mentioned in the Bible, David Nathan, they were two different people. So when I'm seeking guidance from the Lord, I can't turn to the first book of David and find my name and read about what God's will is for my life. There are certain things where I need God's direction. Agreed? Okay, good. Uh, so, the Lord communicates to this church through the nine gifts to give direction, to give warning, and to edify. Okay, that's how it was in the early church, and that's how it will continue until the Lord returns. Now, the gifts of Spirit, the Spirit of God will move whenever He wills. Some of the most amazing times that I've ever seen God move has been during a Bible study. Particularly, I remember times we were doing an Old Testament Bible study in a previous church where the Lord on two occasions, just manifested. It was unbelievable. It was incredible. The second t time was us teaching on the um, basic foundations, and the Lord just saw fit to manifest. And it was unbelievable to see God move. But more often than not, the Spirit of God is present in our worship. Psalm chapter 22, verse 3. The Psalm 22, verse 3. I just need to keep Afrikaans up. So when I come back to South Africa, I can communicate with some of our folk in the church. Or try to. Psalm 22, verse 3. The psalmist... David writes, But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Those of you who have got the authorized, the King James Version, your Bible says, but you inhabit. Is that correct? You inhabit, which is a better translation of the Hebrew word, your sub, your sub, which means to dwell, to sit, to... Uh, inhabit God inhabits the praise of his people God dwells in the praise of, of his people when the people of God worship the Lord God oftentimes is present in other words he's receiving he's present to receive the worship you see church unfortunately has become so traditional we come to church and we know we're going to sing songs. So we either put songs up on the overhead or we get our hymn books and off we go. Having a jolly old sing-along to God. Now some of us, our motive might be pure. We really want to worship the Lord and express our love for God. Others of us just want to get through the, the sing-along so we can get to the message. And other of, our, other of us just want to get this whole thing over with so we can go home because we dragged you by our parents. But saints, worship is why God created us. The reason we come together is to worship Him. We don't come together for, to have doctrinal dis discussions, although doctrine is important. We don't come together to, to encourage one another. Although encouraging one another is important. The primary reason for you and I to come together is to give glory to God who so loved us that He willingly took on the form of a man, allowed Himself to be 
brutally tortured, nailed to a cross, so that we could be saved and adopted and become the sons and daughters of God. This is the reason, because God in His love has made a way for humanity to be spared His wrath. That we don't have to go with Satan to hell, as Jesus says, that hell was created for the devil and his angels in Matthew 25. God in His mercy sent His Son that we don't have to go to the place of torment and judgment. And what is our response? Oh, gee, that's kind of cool, hey? No, our response is, God, how merciful you are. How wonderful you are. I just want to praise you. I want to glorify you. I want to express my gratitude to you. And the Lord says, well, thank you. And He inhabits the praises. So when the heart is genuine, the response of God is genuine. God inhabits. You see, there were a few things the charismatic and Pentecostal church got right. There were a number of things that got right in the early days. And that is the importance of worship. The reformers and, and the likes of the Wesley brothers used so, uh, hymns as a method of communicating doctrine. So when you take out the old hymn books, they are rich in doctrine. They are precious in understanding. So as we sing them, we are, we are teaching ourselves that which God has done. And God used that as a method of instruction because the populace at that time were illiterate. They couldn't read or write. So how do, you, how do they learn for themselves? Well, you use the best method of instruction, song. You put something to song. Isn't it amazing how we remember songs from years ago? Because it's just a wonderful... It's, the brain is, is, is so designed that we remember things through song. But God is seeking those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. So worship is not a time to learn. It's a time to express. There's a time for hymns and praise God, let them never die. And some of you who are not au fait with the old hymns should go and learn some of them or read some. And they're really precious and beautiful and just so, so deep in, in truth. But God desires that we worship Him, and we, when we, you and I worship God in spirit and truth, the Lord responds. Now, this is a pattern in Scripture. Can I show you? Thank you. I was going to show you anyway. <laughs> if you turn with me to 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 10. 1 Samuel chapter 10. Saul is about to be become the first king of Israel, and Samuel the prophet, who now has learned to hear the voice of God, gives him a prophetic word. And he says to Saul, in verse 5 of chapter 10, he says, After that you shall come to the hill of God, where the Philistine garrison is. And it will happen when you have come there to the city that you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high places with a st stringed instrument, a tambourine, a flute, and a harp before them, and they will be prophesying. So, Sam, so Saul, you're going to see the following signs on your journey, which is a proof that God has called you as king. You're going to see a group of prophets, and they're going to have musical instruments, and they're going to be prophesying. Verse 6, then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you. And you'll prophesy with them and be turned into another man. Interesting. There is, they're going to come, Saul's going to come across a group of men worshiping God and prophesying. Now, for, do you remember that the Greek word for prophesy used in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 is the Greek word prophetelio, and it means to speak under inspiration. It doesn't necessarily mean foretelling. So it doesn't necessarily mean, thus says the Lord, next week such and such is going to happen. To speak under inspiration means to speak as the Spirit enables you. So on the spectrum of prophetelio, on the one side you have the thus says the Lord. Tuesday, March next year, this is going to happen. That is prophecy. On the other side is I just sense God wants to need to give you a hug and tell you that He loves you. 
Do you see? It's just a sense that God would have me do something or say something. So you have this very broad spectrum. This is what the Greek word implies. That's why Paul says, I desire that you all prophesy. Not that you all become prophets, but that you all learn to speak by the encouragement of the Holy Spirit. It's like today, when I asked a question, has anybody been sort of wanting to get more understanding on Reformed theology? Right? That is what's called a word of knowledge. How did it come? I'm praying, Lord, for the church. What's your heart? And I'm sensing there are those who are inquiring. Is it my own intelligence? No. For those of you who know me, there's not much of that. It is the Spirit of the Lord. All right. These prophets are prophesying. Saul accompanies them and begins to prophesy. The Spirit of God comes upon him. As the Spirit of God is upon them, so there's an atmosphere around them. The Spirit of God is present. As the Spirit of God was present in Capernaum, where Jesus was sitting with the Pharisees, the Spirit of God was present. So he too is present with the prophets. We turn over to Second Kings because we need to have more than one example to build a doctrine. We can't base a doctrine on one verse of Scripture. We must see clear pattern throughout the Bible. That is the only way we can truly establish a doctrine. Agreed? Praise the Lord. Second Kings chapter 3. Elijah, sorry, Elisha the prophet is asked by Joram, king of Israel, whether he ought to go to battle. And in verse 15, Elisha responds and he says, But now bring me a musician. You want a word from the Lord? You want the counsel of God? Elisha's response is, Now bring me a musician. You want to know the heart of God? Why are we having a praise and worship service? Bring me a musician. Then it happened when the musician played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. And he said, Thus says the Lord. Elisha understood something. We want to know the will of God. Well, let's go to God who makes his will known. Here, in this case, it just so happened that Elisha was moved to ask for a musician. That in the worship of the Lord, the Spirit of God will be present. Now, that's not a formula. Christians love formulas. We love formulas. Having a worship service doesn't mean that God will manifest. Okay? Having a worship service doesn't mean that God has no choice but to manifest. God does not respond to the dictates of man. God does not respond to our orders. All right? But there are times, especially in worship, where the Lord does manifest himself. Are you seeing what I'm trying to say? There are churches who, because God showed up last Sunday during a time of worship, now this Sunday we're going to have a time of worship because God's going to show up. They then try to formularize everything based on an experience. That's why you still have nutty Christians today marching around cities. Because just once in the Bible, God did it. We love formulas. God does not respond to formula. But we have evidence in Scripture that when there is the genuine worship of God, there are times where God responds. And, and finally, we see it in Acts chapter 16, where Paul and, I believe it's Silas by this time, have been beaten in Philippi for preaching the gospel, and more, more especially for casting out a demon from a slave girl. And so they were beaten and put in stocks in, the, in a prison in Acts chapter 16, verse 24. The jailer, have, having received such a charge, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Verse 25. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loose. They were worshiping God. 
having been beaten and broken, they're worshiping God and God responds. And we have then the foundation of Elvis Presley's song, Jailhouse Rock. <laughs> it just so happens that it's in the atmosphere of worship that the Lord responds. Are you seeing this pattern? Now, we don't have worship services so that God could respond. We have worship services because we love Him. Because we have a desire to worship Him. This is the primary reason you and I worship God. This is the only reason we worship God. Because we love Him. And we want to express that love to Him. Having said that, though, there are often times where the Lord responds. Because God inhabits the praises of his people what do we do in such times well firstly we need to learn to respond to the voice of the spirit the bible tells us in romans chapter 8 verse 14 that the sons of god are led by the spirit of god you can turn there and just mark that and check it make sure that I'm quoting it correctly. Romans 8 verse 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. You and I should be led of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said that when the Spirit of truth has come, He will lead you into all truth. The Holy Spirit is our parakletos. He is our helper, not our comforter. He's the one who assists us in serving God and knowing the heart of God. So the children of God, that's you and I, should be led by the Spirit of God. We should be acutely aware of His leading. We should be. we not, but we should be. Now how do you know the voice of the Spirit? How do you know the leading of the Spirit? Well, that's what's really important saints very seldom will you ever hear anything audible from god let me assure you you will not hear god's voice audibly in all my christian walk 32 years of praying fasting crying out to the lord i've only ever heard god speak to me audibly once and it wasn't much two words have faith Now, I know my charismatic brethren seem to have these long conversations with God. Uh, they are obviously more spiritual than I am. Oh, it's a different God. Oh, it's too much pizza. <laughs> but the Lord speaks to us in our spirit. He speaks to us in the inner man. God is spirit. And he relates to us by our spirit. He doesn't relate to us by our soul. It is like calling to like, spirit unto spirit. When the Lord called Elijah to go to Mount Horeb, and he appeared to Elijah, he first appeared, or there was a great earthquake and a howling wind and all sorts of things and the bible says and god was not in it but then elijah heard a still small voice and he understood that was god god speaks into our spirit and it's the ladies would probably be understand this better it's an inkling it's kind of like a knowing without a rational knowledge you kind of know but it's not in your mind and it's a, it's a nagging. It's kind of like a little niggle that doesn't go away. Okay, you guys look at me like this. <laughs> it's the voice of the Lord. He speaks into our spirits, not our head. You're not gonna, you know, we're all waiting, oh, scanning our brain. What's God saying? Nothing. Your brain is the battleground of the enemy. Your head is where Satan attacks and you've got to renew your mind. It's your spirit that God speaks into. And so we have words in the Bible like Elijah heard a still 
small voice. In Acts chapter 27, where Paul was being taken to Rome as a prisoner to testify to Caesar, that in verse uh, 9 of Acts chapter 27, the Bible says, Now when much time had been spent and sailing was now dangerous because of the fast, because the fast was already over, Paul advised them saying, verse 10, Men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster. Notice the word he uses. I perceive. Was Paul saying, look, this is not the right season for sailing? No. He is saying, look, it's not the right season, but I have, a, I have this inkling that this is not going to end well. He didn't say, thus says the Lord. He says, I have a perception. I have a sense. This is how the Spirit speaks to us. It's this a sense that's, that comes from here. It's not coming from your head. I perceive. So you say, well, David, how do you know that last week, twice during the worship service, we missed God? How do you know? Well, it's the same as then before when I left for um, America, I think it was, where I was worshiping and, and just praising God. And as I'm praising God... I have this perception, go pray for Kevin, release him, and they need to pray for you. And I'm arguing, but Lord, I've done that. And so I continue worshiping the Lord, and this perception, you need to do it. And my head responds, as all I heads respond, but I have. I'm trying to rationalize, but it gets... So I said to the Lord, I said, if this is you, bear witness. And so I open my eyes, and JP's like this, he's turning around... And JP doesn't normally turn around during a worship service. So I step into the aisle, he steps into the aisle. I step towards the front, he steps towards me. And I look at him, and I say, I need to pray for Kevin. He says, yes, and we need to pray for you. All right? Do you see? Did I hear a voice saying, thus says the Lord, David? Did the building shake? Did the earth split? Did a hand come upon the screen and begin to write? Many, many, no. It was a perception. And we learn to get trained by that sense of the whisper of God. That I perceive it's not in my head. I learn to hearken to my spirit. Too many Christians are living in their head. Now the mind needs to be renewed. The mind needs to be full of the word of God. We are to sow the word of God into us. And to meditate. This is all in the soul realm. These are good and virtuous Pursuits, but we need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit who indwells us. Okay. Don't listen to your head, listen to your heart. However, having said that, we are called to test all things. You see, the Bible has given us safeguards so that the enemy. And the soul of men cannot take advantage of the church. The Bible is full of safeguards. The Toronto thing should never have happened. The Rodney Howard Brown should never have been allowed a platform. Bethel Reading should be ostracized by the Christian world. Corbus van Rensburg, the late Corbus van Rensburg, should have been marked as a heretic by the church. Because God has given us safeguards. He's given us checks and balances. We are to desire spiritual gifts, but we are to watch for the enemy. So if you turn with me to 1 John chapter 4, because I want us to get this thing in balance. I want us to stop shying away from the things of the Spirit. But by the same token, I don't want us to allow the enemy to come in. All things decently and in order. Not quenching the spirit, but not giving place to the enemy. So let's see what the Bible has to say. First John chapter 4. First John chapter 4. Reading from verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, just pause there. Most of you 
think, or before reading the scripture, you would have assumed that this scripture says, test the prophecy. Test the word. Here, John, by the Holy Spirit, is not warning the church to test the word, but to test the spirit. In other words, a person can speak truth, but it's not the Holy Spirit. It is a true word. It's a true word of knowledge. But it's not by the Holy Spirit. Remember in Philippi, the slave girl had a spirit, a demonic spirit of divination. And she followed Paul and Silas and said, Hearken unto these men, for they are servants of the Most High God. The Spirit in her spoke truth. These two men are of God. Test the Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit gave Paul some time later the gift of discernment. No, there's no such gift. The gift of discerning of spirits. Some time later, he turned around and he rebuked the demon. He didn't know it was a demon until the Holy Spirit came upon him and the gift of discerning of spirits was given Paul for that moment where Paul could see by what spirit this woman was operating. Test the spirit before you test the word. Now we do test the word. Any prophecy must line up with the word of God, must line up perfectly with the word of God. God will never speak outside of his own word. God has exalted his word above all his name, as we know well in this church. Test the spirit. I've listened to people speak truth, but it's not the spirit of God. We have a little bit of this in our church of late, where people are giving words. It's not the spirit of God. Let me assure you, it's not the spirit of God. Test the spirit. Is that of God? Is it bearing witness? Because somebody can speak truth and your spirit just goes, Ugh. you ever sense that? Somebody has, has a word for you and it's spot on, but you've got this yuck in your spirit. Just, it just doesn't sit right. But it's truth, but it's not bearing witness. Test the spirit. 1 Corinthians 14, Paul talks about when somebody or a group of people or a number of people want to speak prophetically. In 1 Corinthians 14, he talks about when the prophets speak or those who have who God is using with the gift of prophecy. He says in 1 Corinthians 14, 29, let two or three prophets speak. 1 Corinthians 14, 29. Let two or three prophets speak. In other words, now let me say, it's not prophets as in those called into the fivefold office of prophet. Those who believe that God has given them a prophetic word. Remember the prophetic word? Can range from an edification all the way through to uh, thus saith the Lord. And he says in verse 29, let two or three prophets speak, never more. And we know why. We know why it's never four. We all, we all know why it's two or three. I have told you many times before. But anyway, for the sake of, for the sake of clarity, every truth of God must be established on the mouth of two or three witnesses. If the Lord has something to say to the church, it's always going to be two or three witnesses. First, the first one, speaking the word. The second one, confirming the word. Maximum three. God, never, will, God will never share with the church two th things. He'll... One message, one correction, one edification, and you'll confirm it. God does not give a church two messages. One word, do it. If the church is obedient, God will speak again. That's why it's two or three. One message, confirmed, maximum three, thereby adhering to the biblical principle of a witness. Every witness, two or three. Never four or five. Never one. And then Paul goes on to say, in verse 30, 
Oh, sorry. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. Let everyone judge what's being said. Now you're judging the word. So John says, test the spirit. Paul is saying, judge what's being said. But it's the same concept. Judge the spirit and judge what's being said. John is more concerned about the spirit, understanding the spirit of deception. Rodney Howard Brown came speaking truth. You listen to his messages, there's a lot of truth in them. There's a lot of truth in them. Some of what he said is actually really good. Really, really good. And there's some stuff that he says that's really, really bad. You see, it's only a little bit of arsenic that, that you need to kill you. Just put a little bit of arsenic into a glass of fruit juice. The fruit juice is really great, but the arsenic is going to kill you. Test the spirit. Here, Paul is saying, judge. Some guy comes up and says, thus says the Lord. And we all say, oh, God's going to speak. No, when somebody says to me, thus says the Lord, I'm like this. <laughs> right. Go for it. <laughs> I'm hyper alert. My spiritual senses are on maximum. Now, I'm going to test what you're going to say. Don't be dumb sheep. Be wise servants. Right? Test. Let the others judge. Verse 30, but if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first one keep silent. That's, that's the part we don't like in our churches. I've never seen it done by anyone else. I mean, I've seen it done numerous times, but I've never seen it done by anyone else. Where somebody's prophesying or think they, since they're prophesying and it's not of God, and somebody stands up and stops them. I've only ever seen that I'm sorry, I've never seen it by anyone else in the church. I've seen it a few times, but never seen it by anyone else. Where we know that something's not of God, and we allow the person to continue because we don't want to offend them, because we're all ever so polite. Politeness is not a gift of the Spirit. And nice is not a gift of the Spirit. Nor is it a fruit of the Spirit. Kindness is a fruit of the Spirit. And gentleness is a fruit of the Spirit. So one can correct somebody who's in error with a kindness and a gentleness. In other words, it's not to embarrass them. There's a way that we can stop somebody. Or there's a way that we can bring a correction with a gentleness. But we are called to judge. We are called to test. This is a safeguard. Are you understanding that? So when that, that whole kundalini fawning on the ground and acting like an imbecile, came to this country. It could have been stopped the very first, the very first meeting that it came to this country. Because Jackie and I were in that very first meeting. It could have been stopped there and then. Where the senior pastor knew that these people were under a demonic influence. Jackie and I were in that service at that time, and the senior pastor came up to me. I was a pastor in the church at the time, and he said, David, these people are under a demonic spirit. Come, we need to cast it out. At that moment, it could have been stopped in this country. But instead of casting Rodney out, we're casting out the demons. Dealing with the fruit, not dealing with the root. Do you see what I'm saying? Because it would have been impolite to stop him. No. A shepherd cares for his sheep. A shepherd protects his sheep from the wolves. A shepherd will give his life for the sheep. We test. We... we, we we test the spirits. We judge all things. And finally, in 1 Thessalonians, as we put this together, where's the middle road? It's 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 5. And we'll take up from verse 16. Where the Bible says, Rejoice always. Rejoice always. When should we rejoice? Is always a time of day or a day of the week? Saturday, always, Monday, Tuesday, always, Thursday, Friday. Always is not when we come together as Christians. Always is not when you are with believers. Always is always. Rejoice Always pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. God wants you to be thankful, rejoicing, happy Christians. Amen. This is God's will. 
Some of you even started smiling. It didn't hurt, eh? You might be a bit stiff tomorrow, but it's good for you. <laughs> Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Zbenumi. Do not zbenumi the spirit. What does that mean? Extinguish, fire extinguisher. That word in the Greek means do not put out, do not extinguish as a fire extinguisher. Do not extinguish the spirit. Do not forbid the spirit from moving. Do not quench him. Do not extinguish him. Do not put him out. When the spirit of God is moving amongst you, be sensitive, cooperate, yield. Do not go on to the next thing. Wait. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. See the balance? Test, don't despise. Allow the spirit, don't allow the false spirits. Do you see there's a middle road? Always a middle road. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, test all things. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. So here Paul is encouraging the Thessalonians to allow the things of the Spirit to continue. And they were familiar with the gifts of the Spirit. If you read 1 Thessalonians, you'll see in verse 5 of chapter 1 that Paul says, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Spirit, and in much assurance. So when Paul preached to the Thessalonians, the gifts of the Spirit accompanied his ministry. And so they were familiar with the power of God. And he's now saying, don't quench the Holy Spirit. Because think about it. Isn't that like many of us? We came to the Lord and we encountered the glory of God and the power of God. And some of us might have been in churches where we've seen the gifts function. I mean, just look at this church. You know, we have Tammy at the back who's brought a miracle to church. The doctor said they couldn't have children. Impossible. Well, there the child is. Cheat in the same thing. Doctor said they couldn't have children. Boom, they had children. Okay, we've seen the power of God. We've seen the gift of healings. God healed their bodies. We've seen prophecy come to pass. We've seen the gifts. And some of you in your previous churches might have seen the gifts. But now, because of all that has gone wrong in the church, we would rather not see. And Paul is saying, do not quench the Holy Spirit. Desire spiritual gifts. So how do we respond when we are not familiar? For many of us are not familiar with the working of the Holy Spirit. It's not, it's not a criticism. It's just, it's just a truth. Well, those who are most sensitive to the Holy Spirit, those who are more familiar, allow them to lead us. Without offense. It's not an offense if, if, if during worship where we're... we're one of the leaders of the church go up to the worship team and say, let's just, not the next song, just go into the next. It's not, it's, not, it's not a criticism. Are we understanding that? It's not a criticism. We have to learn. Samuel had to learn to hear the voice of God. And it's just, if you, now, you might think you have a word from the Lord. You might, in a time of worship, you might sense that God's, wants something to say to the church, well, how, what, what do you do? You get up and you blurt it out? Well, you could, but that's dangerous unless you're 100% sure that God has spoken. And why is it dangerous? Because if you're wrong, you have to be corrected publicly. If something is said publicly, it must be judged publicly and if need be, corrected publicly. Now, it is never anybody's intention to embarrass another one. It's not, but if you're going to say something that's off the wall, it is wrong to take your side afterwards and say, well, that was wrong based on the Scripture because you've been corrected, but the, left, the rest of the church has gone home with error. So the right way is you go to one of the, the leaders and they all seem to be sitting in front. I mean, there's, there's Hugh over there, there's uh, Sean and then there's JP one behind and Kevin would oftentimes be in front. Uh, so you go to the leaders and just say, look, I just sense. And let them judge. 
and by handing it over to the authority to make the decision, you yourself now come out from responsibility. Understand that? You have now submitted yourself to the leaders of the church, which means that they're now responsible for what you say, not you. Now that's safe. I like that. I like it when somebody else is responsible for what I say. <laughs> All right. Are there any questions, comments, concerns? That's perfect. That's 100%. That's right. And that's, that's the way it should be done. Unless, yeah, if, if, if it's one of the leaders who we know to be trustworthy in the things of the Spirit, then they can speak forth. But we still judge. So if I have to give a word, you don't say, oh, well, this is David, you know, he's got to be right. No. Only Jesus is right. No man is infallible. So we test all things, no matter who it comes from. Okay. The same thing when it comes to the gift of tongues and interpretation. This is not speaking in tongues. This is the gift of tongues. There's a difference between somebody just praising God in tongues and the gift of tongues. If it's the gift of tongues, there will be an interpretation. There will be. But if somebody's just really emotional and excited and begins to speak loudly in tongues, that's not, necessary, not necessarily a gift of tongues. Okay. Good. If everyone... More or less understand. So it's a sensitivity. Now, please, I hope, I hope the worship team is not now paranoid. <laughs> no, no, I'll be sitting at the back. The thing is, we're not, and here's the danger. Now we're going to the time of worship, God's going to move. No. No. But if He does move, we need to be sensitive. If He's present, you, you, so let's not get into formula. Okay, be sensitive. If you're just sensing a, this is continuous worship without a song, that's fine. Okay, don't go with the program. God's not program driven. The kingdom of God, as Paul says, as I close, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 20, the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. It's in dunamis. We do not serve a dead God. So, hand over to the worship team, and well, JP, I don't know if you go straight into worship. As we do, let's pray as the worship team goes, comes forward. Father God, Lord, we thank you for your precious word. Lord, we acknowledge that you're the sovereign, almighty God that bows to no man, that takes instruction from no man, who has no need of man. But Lord, as we've seen in your scriptures, as we've, as we've seen through your apostles, Lord, that we ought to desire spiritual gifts. That, O oh Lord, that you who are omnipotent, you are almighty, you know where every man and woman and, and young person in this church is who desire to, to encourage, exhort, if need be, bring correction. O oh God, give us an ability to, to, be, to be sensitive to you, Lord. Be gracious where we miss you, Father. Lord, as children, we ask that you guide us. Lord, we ask that where we have hindered you, where we have quenched your spirit, that you forgive us, Father. And Lord, have your way amongst us truly. Oh God, that your name be glorified. As we worship you, let it be because we are so grateful for your love, for your mercy. Though we fail, though we fall, yet your mercy and grace is so abundant. Let it be for this reason that we come into your presence with thanksgiving in our heart, with Worship upon our lips. And Lord, if you do choose to respond, oh God, give us the sensitivity. But Lord, in all things, you are sovereign. We love you and worship you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.